Release the hound. <laughs> Once again, you are listening to the Hounds of Diana on 247worldradio.com. My name is Harrison Katz, and I am your host. This evening, ladies and gentlemen, it is March 7th, 2022. And yesterday was an extremely significant date in American history, as is today and tomorrow and the following day, which will be Wednesday the 9th. And to all of you Americans out here listening to my voice this evening, if you do not understand the significance behind these dates, then you know nothing about modern American politics. I'm talking the last 100 years. And you know nothing about the way the U.S. government interacts with its own citizens. So tonight, this is the topic that we will be covering. And hopefully by the end of this evening, I will hopefully persuade the, few, the, the, the most of you out there. Few of you understand this, but the majority of you don't. So hopefully I can shed a little light on this and you can understand how America has sold its birthright. And that is a good segue to tonight's scripture verse and readings coming from the book of Genesis chapter 25 and verses 29 through 34. And Jacob sawed pottage, meaning he, he boiled some food. And Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, in the Old Testament and biblical sense, your birthright is your inheritance. Esau sold his birthright, his inheritance to Jacob forever to be fed because he was so hungry. This, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly what happened to the United States of America with the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in March 1933. He is the our American Esau and he sold our birthright. But to who? Well, if you're listening to this show then you should know firsthand that I'm going to point my finger directly to the top at the Jesuits and the papacy as the first cause of devil, of the devil in <clears throat> his worldly kingdom as his first choice as the specific group of men that he uses to carry out his plans, his goals. So in order to understand this, I'm going to be reading from a couple different documents tonight and the first source and in my opinion the best source in understanding what happened to this country 
on March 6th, 1933, which at that time the FDR declared the three-day banking holiday. So technically this today, March 7th, is the 89th anniversary of the second day of that banking holiday. But the best source to understand this is none other than the propri proprietor of 247worldradio.com, Pastor Eric John Phelps. And I will be reading this next portion directly from one of his course books in his private American citizenship course. The plot of the Society of Jesus to rule the United States was first made known by Samuel Morse, the father of Morse code. That plot was fully revealed by ex-priest Charles Chiniqui, who also exposed the Jesuit hand behind the murder of President Abraham Lincoln in 1865. On the design to take the United States, Chiniqui wrote of a meeting of priests he attended at Buffalo in the spring of 1852. The following was said, <clears throat> excuse me, quote, we are determined, like you, to take possession of the United States and rule them. But we cannot do that without acting secretly and with the utmost wisdom. If our plans are known, they will surely be defeated. Silently and patiently, we must mass our Roman Catholics in the great cities of the United States, remembering that the vote of a poor journeyman, though he be covered with rags, has as much weight in the scale of power as the millionaire Astor, and that if we have two votes against his one, he will become as powerless as an oyster. Let no one awake those sleeping giants today. Let us pray, God, that they may sleep and dream their sweet dreams a few more years. What will those hypocritical and godless sons and daughters of the fanatical pilgrim fathers say when not a single judge, not a single teacher, not a single policeman will be elected if he be not a devoted Irish Roman Catholic? What will those so-called giants think of their matchless shrewdness and ability when not a single senator or member of Congress will be chosen if he be not submitted to our Holy Father the Pope? What a sad figure those Protestant Yankees will cut when we will not only elect the president but fill and command the armies, man the navies, and hold the keys to the public treasury. It will be then, it will then be time for our faithful Irish people to give up their grog shops in order to become judges and governors of the land. Then, yes, then we will rule the United States and lay them at the feet of the vicar of, of Jesus Christ, that he may put an end to their godless system of education and impious laws of liberty of conscience, which are an insult to God and man." Unquote. In 1901, a more concise statement was given by James Quigley, Archbishop of Chicago. He boldly declared, quote, within 20 years, this country will rule the world. Kings and emperors will soon pass away and the democracy of the United States will take their place. When the United States rules the world, the Catholic Church will rule the world. Hence we see the Jesuit order's political, financial, and military design to first conquer the sovereign people of the United States, then to use them to impose the temporal power of the Pope over all nations. To accomplish this diabolical vision, the de jure, or uh, by law, constitutional civilian government must be, quote, temporarily ousted under a declared, quote, state of national emergency and a de facto or, in fact, military government must be imposed in its place. Once accomplished, all financial power could be centralized in New York City, subject to the Archbishop of New York, overseen by the Jesuits of Fordham University, and all military power could be centralized in Washington, D.C., subject to the, wa to the Archbishop of Washington, D.C., overseen by the Jesuits of Georgetown University. This day would arrive 
on a Thursday, March 9th, 1933. Rome would make good on its promise to conquer the United States. The Jesuits of Georgetown University would use Franklin D. Roosevelt to bring it to pass. They needed to create the necessary crisis to implement a coup d'etat that would justify the temporary suspension of limited constitutional government in Washington. The design was well conceived and transpired over a period of 30 years. First, the order would command, and command its paramount American banker, J.P. Morgan, to cause a financial panic in 1907, justifying the creation of the Federal Reserve Banking System in 1913. Reticent enemies of the plan would be eliminated in 1912. The means of elimination would be the sinking of the Titanic owned by J.P. Morgan's White Star Line. The Federal Reserve Act was passed in the evening of December 23, 1913, when most of the congressional members had returned to their states for Christmas break. The Pope's central bank was now in place to finance the military government yet to be imposed. President Wilson later confessed, quote, I have betrayed my country. Secondly, a World War I statute had to be put in place <clears throat> and kept in place after the hostilities upon which, authority, which, uh, upon which authority a, quote, national emergency could be declared in a time of peace. That law was known as the Trading with the Enemy Act, passed on October 6, 1917, after America had entered the Great War. And it's very interesting also, FDR at this time during World War I was secretary or undersecretary of the Navy. And it is said that FDR was the one who proposed some other statute that he found to get the Trading with the Enemy Act passed. FDR was behind that in 1917, while he was still secretary or undersecretary of the Navy. So we'll continue. <clears throat> this trading of the Enemy Act, it was never repealed. The statute was amended 14 times from 1918 to 1930, fitting it for its intended use in 1933. One of the words added to Section 5B of the Act was, quote, hoarding hoarding. It would come in handy later. Thirdly, a national crisis had to be created. Enter the Great Depression of 1929. It was caused by the Federal Reserve Bank withdrawing currency from circulation. Further, a massive short selling of stock on the, on the uh, stock exchange led by Irish American Roman Catholic Joseph P. Kennedy, who was a Knight of Malta, effectively crashed the market. This plunged the nation into a social and financial upheaval lasting from 1929 to 1939. Ten million people would die. The depth of the Depression would be 1932. The year, 30, the year 32nd degree Scottish Rite Freemason Franklin Roosevelt was elected to office, to office backed by 4th degree Knights of Columbus, Al Smith, and the Jesuits ruling Tammany Hall. He was also backed by the Jesuits at Fordham, but we'll get to that. The Jesuits now had their man in place to, quote, crown the order's enterprise with success. It was now time to conquer the limited Protestant constitutional republic, converting it into an unlimited Jesuit empire. The day of inauguration had arrived. Franklin Roosevelt is sworn into office on March 4th, 1933. In the background are no less than six fourth-degree Knights of Columbus composing the Honor Guard, evidenced by the wearing of their chapeaus, which are their hats with their big feathers. Off to FDR's right is a priest sitting in a chair donning his beretta. FDR declares this day, quote, a day of national consecration, end quote, and reveals he, quote, may call for a temporary departure from the normal balance of public procedure. End quote. He makes known that he intends to ask Congress for, quote, broad executive power to wage war against the emergency as great as the power that would be given to me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe, end quote. 
He wanted emergency war powers to lead, quote, this great army of our people dedicated to a disciplined attack upon our common problems, end quote. He intended to turn the nation into a war camp. On March 6th, 1933, FDR declares a state of national emergency. His proclamation 2039 is based upon a statute, not the Constitution. That law, that law is the amended Trading with the Enemy Act, cleverly referred to in the proclamation as Section 5B of, an act, of the Act of October 6, 1917. You see, they didn't even have the guts to use the actual name, the Trading with the Enemy Act, as as amended by the Emergency Banking Relief Act. Instead, they only referred to it as the date, as the act on and the date that the act was passed. Upon another proclamation of the president, Congress assembles in Washington on March 9, 1933. It is urged to quickly pass H.R. 1491, titled the Emergency Banking Relief Act. It is an act that is not in print and no one has read, that only the speaker possesses. He, too, read just three times to the House, and that no one knows who, in fact, is its author. The man pushing the act is none other than the most powerful man in the Senate, Jimmy F. Burns, surnamed the, quote, assistant president. The act passes the House, is sent to the Senate for passage, FDR signs it into law, and then decrees Proclamation 2040, continuing the terms of Proclamation 2039 until terminated by the president. This act, carte blanche, approved and confirmed every proclamation that the president made beginning on March 4, 1933 to the day of inauguration. Join me on the other side after this quick commercial break on the Hounds of Diana on 24-7 World Radio. Listening to 24 7 World Radio, home of Eric John Phelps and Vatican Assassins. This is Brother Nicholas. Join me every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the German Bible Truth Hour and at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Dutch Bible Truth Hour on 24 7 World Radio. This is Brother Nicholas. Ich lade euch herzlich ein, mich anzuhören jeder Dienstag am 2 Uhr nachmittags amerikanische Zeit für die deutsche Bibelwahrheitsstunde und 3 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit für die niederländische Bibelwahrheitsstunde am World Radio 24-7. Dit is Bruder Nico. U bent hartelijk uitgenodigd om elke Dienstag um 2 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit het Duitse Bijbel waarheidsuur te volgen en drie uur Amerikaanse standaardtijd het Nederlandse Bijbel waarheidsuur te volgen op 24-7 World Radio. This is Eric John Phelps. Please listen to my broadcast, The Eric John Phelps Show, as I preach the true gospel of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Defend the Protestant Reformation that birthed Western civilization and expose the counter-reformation of the Jesuit order seeking to make the Pope of Rome the universal monarch of the world. Join me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on 247worldradio.com. You're listening to Your Source for the Truth. This is 24-7 World Radio. Welcome back to the Hounds of Diana, everyone. I'm your host, Harrison Katz. So we're going to leave off reading from that very condensed but concise and very informative uh, summation by Pastor Eric John Phillips that I was reading out of his private American citizenship course. Uh, I would recommend any everyone, if you 
have the funds and can afford it, you need to get a hold of Eric John Phelps's private American citizenship information. The education that you will get alone is worth the money. Now, what you choose to do with it, that, of course, is up to you. But moving on. So Brother Eric said a lot in that short condensed, but I can tell you of two things he is absolutely correct. One is what, in fact, FDR did in seizing all the persons, places, and things in this country, putting it up for collateral to the national debt so the Federal Reserve can loan us our money. Understand? We are all deemed as collateral for the national debt. That is, if you have a registered birth certificate, which we all do. So <clears throat> his analysis of what, in fact, FDR did is 100 percent correct, and we will get into some more information confirming this. But secondly, is who was ultimately behind it? And his conclusion that the Jesuits and the papacy were behind it is 100 percent correct as well. And so in order to just confirm what Eric John Phelps has already put out there and has been teaching for years now, I think I took his his the course, his first course back in 2000, 2015, 2016, and then took the advanced course several years later. But now we will be reading from a document titled Franklin D. Roosevelt and American Catholicism, 1932 to 1936, a dissertation submitted to the graduate faculty of the Louisiana State University and Agricultural and Mechanical College and partial fulfillment of the requirement for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in the Department of History by George Quitman Flynn from Loyola University and Louisiana State University, January 1966. So, written from someone at a Jesuit college. Now, in June 1929, Roosevelt spoke at Fordham University, a Jesuit institution in New York City. Now, in 1929, FDR is still governor of New York. In 1929, Roosevelt spoke at Fordham University, a Jesuit institution in New York City. In his address, he praised those men and women who turned their backs on materialistic careers to devote their life to charity and the service of God. More important than FDR's theme, however, was the fact that when the Jesuit president of Fordham, upon giving Roosevelt an honorary degree, commented that here was a man who might someday be president. The 10,000 in attendance cheered enthusiastically. It seemed that some American Catholics could look upon the presidential candid candidacy of Franklin Roosevelt with favor, an attitude that his own understanding and sympathy for them had generated. So it is in this document that I found that FDR received an honorary degree from Fordham University in 1929. And then, of course, was in some prophetic move by the speaker there, predicted that he could one day be president. Well, wouldn't you know it? Now, as the election year of 1932 dawned, it became clear that the Democrats had their best chance of winning the presidency since Woodrow Wilson's triumph in 1916. This, was, this fact was probably the main reason for Al Smith's decision to contest the nomination with Roosevelt. That's uh, Roman Catholic Al Smith, who has who's the Al Smith dinner in New York is named after. 
This put the Roosevelt forces in an embarrassing position of courting the support of those sections of the country that had rejected Smith in 1928, when Smith ran for president in 1928, but was highly rejected because of his Catholic beliefs. The ensuing fight for the nomination produced a bitter reaction among m many Eastern Catholics, and after the convention, Roosevelt devoted a major effort to woo them back into the Democratic fold. Catholic reaction to the news that Smith had decided to seek the nomination in 1932 was ambiguous. It was true that some Catholic political analysts felt that his entrance on the scene would stop the, quote, Roosevelt Express, end quote and that Smith had a good chance to win both the nomination and the election. Furthermore, Jim Farley had found spotty support for Smith in his tour of the country. That's Roman Catholic Knight of Malta, Jim Farley, who later when uh, FDR would become, would become president, would be elected president, he would um, put Jim Farley as the postmaster general. Smith's strong showing in the Massachusetts and Pennsylvania primaries indicated that too many Easterners that to, that to many Easterners he was still a hero, but Farley noted that the Smith sentiment comes mostly from ardent Catholic admirers and in some instances from strong wet advocates. All the Catholics were not in favor of Smith running again in 1932. Father John A. Ryan, the leading Catholic social thinker throughout the 1930s, remembered the vicious bigotry of 1928 and, re and was reluctant to do anything to revive the spirit. The editor of the Catholic World, Reverend James Gillis, worried about the constitutional crisis which might result from another Smith campaign. After all, if Smith should be rejected again on the basis of his religion, the constitutional clause that no religious test be required for office would prove meaningless. This editor did not feel the, na the nation could stand another display like that of 1928. Yet on second thought, he felt it might be better to clarify the issue once and for all. Another indication of the division of Catholic sentiment towards the Democratic nomination was the fact that the number of prominent Catholic laymen worked actively for Roosevelt. Listen to that again. Another indication of the division of Catholic sentiment toward the Democratic nomination, that's between Al Smith and Roosevelt, who were both seeking the nomination for, 19, for the 1932 election, was the fact that a number of prominent Catholic laymen worked actively for Roosevelt. Senator Thomas J. Walsh of Montana, later selected to be Roosevelt's attorney general, also worked to secure the nominations for FDR in Chicago. Frank P. Walsh, a well-known New York attorney and Catholic layman, supported FDR before and at the convention. So listen to this. You've got Frank P. Walsh, a New York attorney. You've got Thomas J. Walsh, of a senator from Montana, and then you have you have um, you have Walsh, the Jesuit, who was also active and around FDR at this time. Irish Catholic politicians such as Farley and Ed Flynn of the Bronx and James M. Curley of Boston were also behind the Roosevelt machine. Colonel P. H. Callahan, a Kentucky businessman and influential Catholic layman, had urged Roosevelt to make a race long before 1932. Callahan was of the opinion that Smith had received a pro-Catholic vote in 1928 and had no cause to complain about the results. The, Commonwe the Commonweal, a national Catholic magazine edited by Lehman, pledged neutrality in the race for Democratic nomination, but it could not refrain from speaking of Roosevelt as a man whose, quote, strength may be said to lie in a happy blend of skill and knowledge, end quote. The editor also played up the governor's great familiarity with the problem of agriculture and taxation. Another national Catholic magazine, America, published by the Jesuits, was even more vigorous in its opposition. The socialist view of the world was, it declared, totally alien to the Catholic view. Now, this was referring to another uh, candidate. Um, I think it was Norton Thomas. And then it says, furthermore, yeah, the same candidate, Thomas, was in favor of recognizing the Soviet Union, a move that would be strenuously opposed. Now, listen to this. 
you have the Jesuits in America, America Magazine, during this 1932 um, Democratic nominee, when they were trying to figure out who the Catholics were going to back, you had FDR, you had Al Smith, and then you also had this uh, this open socialist, uh, Norton Thomas. Okay, And the Jesuits are saying of Thomas that the socialist view of the world was totally alien to the Catholic view. Just listen to that disinformation. And then it goes on to say that Thomas was in favor of recognizing the Soviet Union. That's exactly what FDR would do when he would get into office. So you see how the Jesuits were playing both sides of the fence. They're giving FDR an honorary degree, and then at the same time, they're running interference against some of his Democratic nominee opponents, saying that they're, they're socialists and that that doesn't match up with the Catholic view of the world. Well, we're going to read here in a little bit that it actually does, and uh, it gets a little more interesting than that. Continuing, the editor of America thought that Catholics were forbidden to vote for Thomas, quote, even in the phantom form of a protest vote. Roosevelt was intimate with many prominent Catholics, and two of his chief advisors, Farley and Flynn, were Catholics. Perhaps the most attractive thing Roosevelt did during the 1932 campaign, from the church's point of view, was to quote from the papal encyclical, Quadrismo Anno of Pius XI, in a speech at Detroit on October 2, 1932, Roosevelt called the encyclical, quote, just as radical as I am, end quote, and, quote, one of the greatest documents of modern times, end quote. The fact that a presidential candidate has quoted approvingly from an encyclical by the Pope had an immediate effect on American Catholics. Oh, I bet it did. To one editor, this demonstrated at, la at last Catholic social teaching was having an effect in this country. Another felt that Roosevelt could not be accused of radicalism by his opponents since he was more radical than the Pope. To some, his actions, implying, quote, endorsement of some fundamental principles of Christian social reform, end quote, required great courage. This public service would suggest, one editor, go down as the most important remark of the entire campaign. <laughs> you hear that? Of his entire campaign. They're saying, the papers in the time, the writers of that time were saying this was the most important remark of FDR's whole campaign. And I contend to agree with them. Because it is giving you an insight, this papal encyclical is giving you an, an insight to exactly what all the radical legislation of the New Deal, what it was based on. But we'll get into that. <clears throat> to some, his actions implying – okay, I already read that. <clears throat> this public service would, would, suggested by one editor, go down as the most important remark of the entire campaign. His condem condemnation of laissez-faire capitalism gave hope that perhaps here was a man really concerned with social justice. There's that Jesuit word, that Jesuit phrase, social justice. Ryan, meaning um, – was it uh, John Ryan, the priest, was not the only prominent Catholic who considered Roosevelt the best choice of 1932. Frank Murphy, mayor of Detroit and later attorney general, supported FDR long before the Chicago Convention and worked actively for his nomination. Frank P. Walsh of New York had been appointed by Governor Roosevelt to the New York Power Authority and had supported the governor for the nomination in 1932. The already famous radio priest of Detroit, Reverend Charles E. Coughlin, came out early in support of Roosevelt. On a visit to New York City with Frank Murphy in the spring of 1932, the priest offered his services to support FDR's – listen to this – to support FDR's theory of government. FDR's theory of government because unless you actually go back and read some 
of the speeches of FDR during his campaign and some of the literature and pamphlets that were passed out that you can still read, you will understand that what FDR did with the New Deal, that is exactly what he campaigned on. He campaigned on radical change. And people voted for him. So again, there's no fraud in this. This has all been done according to our own the, – the laws that we set up ourselves as, 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 a, as Americans. Continuing on in this document. After the election, however, American Catholics went about interpreting the results in their own fashion. Some considered the entire campaign a disappointment and felt sure the depression would continue. Others felt that FDR had proved himself during the campaign and that while he is not so able a man as Alfred E. Smith, he will unquestionably make a splendid president. The name Al Smith continued to appear in Catholic analysis of the election. One publication felt that Smith was solely responsible for Roosevelt's victory in New England. Another theme put forth was that Roosevelt's victory was, quote, poetic retribution for Smith and American Catholics. As one editor expressed it, quote, Al Smith has had his day now, end quote. While some Catholics praised the lack of religious bigotry in the campaign, others noted that the bigotry that did exist was directed against Roosevelt and Garner for their pro-Catholicism. Oh, no religious bigotry in the campaign except for the pro-Catholicism. <laughs> now listen to this. In 1919, the bishops of, of the United States published a document that spelled out a program of, quote, social reconstruction, end quote. And when we get back, we will read a little bit more about what this document on social reconstruction is. Hounds of Diana. 24-7, radio.com. This is 24-7 World Radio, home of Eric John Phelps and Vatican Assassins. This is Eric John Phelps. Please listen to my broadcast, The Eric John Phelps Show, as I preach the true gospel of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, defend the Protestant Reformation that birthed Western civilization, and expose the counter-reformation of the Jesuit order seeking to make the Pope of Rome the universal monarch of the world. Join me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on 247worldradio.com. This is Brother Nicholas. Join me every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the German Bible Truth Hour and at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Dutch Bible Truth Hour on 24-7 World Radio. This is Brother Nicholas. Ich lade euch herzlich ein, mich anzuhören, jeder Dienstag am 2 Uhr nachmittags, amerikanische Zeit, für die deutsche Bibelwahrheitsstunde und drei Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit für die niederländische Bibelwahrheitsstunde am World Radio 24-7. Dit is Buddha Nico. Ich bin hartelijk uitgenodigd om elke dinsdag om twee uur Amerikaanse standaardtijd het Duitse Bijbelwaarheidsuur te volgen en drie uur Amerikaanse standaardtijd het Nederlandse Bijbelwaarheidsuur te volgen op 24-7 World Radio. This is 24-7 World Radio, your source for the truth. Welcome back, everybody. Continuing on with this document. In 1919, the bishops of the United States published a document which spelled out a program of social reconstruction. 
The, pro the program was so radical that one prominent businessman wrote that socialism had found a home in the Catholic Church. Specifically, the bishops called for minimum wage laws and government intervention in the economy to crush monopolies. For labor, they advocated unemployment, health, and old age insurance and government recognition of labor rights to organize. Other measures that they sponsored included public housing developments, legal safeguards relating to women and child labor, and a, sh and a share by labor in management and ownership. The impact of this document can, can be seen in retrospect. By 19, 1945, John T. McNicholas, Archbishop of Cincinnati, was eulogizing Archbishop Schrems, late Bishop of Cleveland, by stressing that the latter had signed the bishop's program of 1919. Archbishop McNicholas pointed out that of the 12 major proposals offered in 1919, all but one had become federal law. All but one. Now, 1945, that's, that's, uh, that's right towards the end of, of the New Deal. It's right at the very end of it. So again, you have FDR who is being influenced by that papal encyclical of Pope Pius XI. And then also he's obviously was following the game plan of this, uh, this bishop, bishop's program of 1919. So... Just in that short section that I just read you from this 400-something page dissertation, you can see that FDR was backed by Catholics. He was backed by the Jesuits. He was supported by a uh, Roman, uh, Roman Catholic industry. And when he was put into power, he did exactly what it was that he was supposed to do, which was declare an emergency, confiscate all the property. But let's get a little deeper into that because I don't think a lot of you really understand the significance of what I'm telling you. So reading from our next document, we're going to be reading from Senate Report number 93-549 which is the report of the Special Committee on the Termination of the National Emergency of the United States Senate, November 19th, 1973, and it's the Special Committee on the Termination of the National Emergency. From the forward, now this is also known as the Church Committee, not the Church Committee on Assassinations, but uh, Frank Church co-chaired this committee on the Special Committee on the Termination of the National Emergency. Again, this is Senate Report number 93-549 <clears throat> from the forward. Since March, since March 9th, 1933, the United States has been in a state of declared national emergency. In fact, there are now in effect four presidentially proclaimed states of a national emergency. In addition to the national emergency declared by President Roosevelt in 1933, there are also the national emergency proclaimed by President Truman on December 16, 1950, during the Korean conflict, and the states of national emergency declared by President Nixon on March 23, 1970, and August 15, 1971. These proclamations give force to 470 provisions of federal law. These hundreds of statutes delegate to the president extraordinary powers, ordinarily exercised by the Congress, which affects the lives of American citizens in a host of all-encompassing manners. The vast, this vast range of powers taken together confer enough author authority to rule the country without reference to normal constitutional processes. Let me read that last sentence again. 
this vast range of powers, meaning the emergency war powers, taken together, confer enough authority to rule the country without reference to normal constitutional processes. Under the powers delegated by these statutes, the presidents may, listen, under the powers delegated by these statutes, the presidents may, one, seize property, two, organize and control the means of production, three, seize commodities, four, assign military forces abroad, five, institute martial law, six, seize control and seize and control all transportation and communication, seven, regulate the operation of private enterprise, eight, restrict travel, and in a plethora of particular ways, control the lives of all American citizens. Those three paragraphs, the first three paragraphs from this report, from this special committee on the termination of the national emergency, every single one of you need to go on the internet and read at least, it's just three paragraphs, man. It'll take five minutes of your time. But in doing so, it can confirm to you through an official government document that what all what I'm saying to you tonight and what Brother Eric John Phelps has been teaching hundreds of people for the past seven, seven, maybe eight years now, this is in fact true. It can be verified in many, many different instances. So I'm going to move forward from the forward, and I'm going to move to the introduction. A brief historical sketch on the origins of emergency powers now in force. Listen to this. Even the Senate knows this. A majority of people of the United States have lived all of their lives under emergency rule for 40 years. Now, 40 that's 40 years when this document, when they published this report, 40 years. Try 89 years, everybody. 89 years. Freedoms and governmental procedures guaranteed by the Constitution have, in varying degrees, been abridged by laws brought into force by states of national emergency. So that first sentence right there should bring a huge question into your mind. Well, I thought the Constitution was law supreme. You're telling me that a statute overrides my constitutional rights? Well, what if that – doesn't that mean that, that that statute is unconstitutional? Ah. See, now you're starting to wake up from your slumber because the Constitution has been set aside. You have to understand this. And if you don't understand that, you will never understand all these goons and these clowns on TV, on the, in the media, all these political pundits, all these political actors in the Senate, in the Congress – You'll never understand any of – because everything they're saying is all the front. They have to keep the illusion of the Constitution, the illusion of the Constitution. But in fact, it is military government. The problem of how a constitutional democracy reacts to great crises, however – far antedates the Great Depression. As a philosophical issue, its origins reach back to the Greek cities, states of the Roman Republic, and in the United States, actions taken by the government in times of great crisis have from at least the Civil War in important ways shaped the present phenomenon of a per permanent state of national emergency. Listen to that last sentence. Shaped the present phenomenon of a permanent state of national emergency. It's permanent, man. 
it's permanent and it's not going anywhere unless we start to educate ourselves on what is really taking place in our own government. You see, we have acquiesced our own birthright. Most of us don't even know we have an estate, an inheritance. We have no idea. The next major development in the use of uh, executive emergency powers came under Franklin D. Roosevelt. The Great Depression had already overtaken the country by the time of Roosevelt's inauguration and confronted him with a totally different crisis. This emergency, unlike those of the past, presented a non-military threat. The Roosevelt administration, however, conceived the economic crisis to be a calamity equally as great as a war and employed the metaphor of war to emphasize the depression's severity. In his inaugural address, Roosevelt said, quote, I shall ask Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency, as great as the power that would be given me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. Many of the members of Roosevelt's administration, including FDR himself, were veterans of the economic mobilization of World War I and drew upon their experiences to combat the new situation. The first New Deal agencies indeed bore strong resemblances to wartime agencies, and many had the term, quote, emergency in their titles, such as the Federal Emergency Relief Administration and the National Emergency Council. And I am going to leave off from reading any more from this report of the Special Committee on the Termination of the National Emergency of the United States, Senate Report Number 93-549. Everyone listening, can you get yourself a copy of that? It's free on the internet. Do yourselves and your families a favor. Get educated. This next quote is I'm going to be quoting from a Representative from Ohio, former representative from Ohio, United States Congressional Congressman James Traficant Jr. from Ohio. And this is from volume uh, from the Congressional Record, March 17, 1933, volume 33, <laughs> 1993, volume 33, page H-1303. Mr. James Traficant addressing the House. Mr. Speaker. We quote, Mr. Speaker, we are here now in Chapter 11. Members of Congress are official trustees presiding over the greatest reorganization of any bankrupt entity in world history, the U.S. government. We are setting forth, hopefully, a blueprint for our future. There are some who say it is a coroner's report that will lead to our demise. It is an established fact that the United States federal government has been dissolved by the Emergency Banking Act, March 9, 1933, 48 Stat 1, Public Law 89-719, declared by President Roosevelt being bankrupt and insolvent. House Joint Resolution 192, 73rd Congressional Session, June 5, 1933, Joint Resolution to Dispend the Gold Standard and Abrogate the Gold Clause Dissolved, the sovereign authority of the United States and the official capacities of all United States government offices, officers, and departments, and is further evidence that the United States federal government exists today in name only. Kind of like the Constitution. It just exists in name only. Quote, the receivers of the United States bankruptcy are the international bankers via the United Nations, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. And I would add in the Vatican, but he does not say so. All the United States officials' departments are now operating within a de facto status in name only under emergency war powers. With the constitutional Republican form of government now dissolved, the receivers of the bankruptcy have adapted a new form of government for the United States. This new form of government is known as a democracy, being an established socialist communist order under a new governor for America. 
This act was instituted and established by transferring and replacing the office of Secretary or Treasury to that of the Governor of the International Monetary Fund. Public Law 94-564, page 8, section H.R. 13955 reads in part, quote, the U.S. Secretary of Treasury receives no compensation for representing the United States. Prior, prior to 1913, most Americans owned clear allodial title to property, free and clear of any liens or mortgages until the Federal Reserve Act of 1933 hypothecated all property within the Federal United States to the Board of Governors and to the Federal Reserve in which the trustees held legal title. The U.S. citizens were the tenants were res registered as a beneficiary of the trust via his or her birth certificate. In 1933, the federal United States hypothecated all the present and future properties, assets, and labor of their, quote, subjects, the 14th Amendment, U.S. citizen, to the Federal Reserve System to be, and I will add this, to be used as collateral for our debt. You all need to remember March 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th, 1933, because it truly was the death of our constitutional republic. And as the banks lay dormant for three nights, only to reopen the third day, to open their tombs of their deposits, but for their depositors to, em to walk in and see that all the gold is gone. Y'all better wake up. God bless. Until next Monday.